Tina's going to be here right next to Yeah, she's going to be late, so. Okay, the workshop will be in order. The uh, next order of business is present to speak. Yes. Well, first of all, <coughs> I'm, I'm, so so I'm Sarah Smith, and I live at 69 Elmage Road for the past 40 years. And <coughs> I know that everybody but Mrs. Perry, and um, what you do is is highly respected and appreciated by me. And though I am a lifelong Democrat, surprise, um, <clears throat> we are all neighbors. I can talk to every person in this town. I don't care what your affiliation is. And I try to be respectful. I'm a straight shooter. Everybody knows that. And what I would like to see this board do is to be open-minded. Um, I would like for us to, I, I don't quite understand why there is opposition to exploratory committees. We are a long way from deciding what we're going to do. And that decision has to work for the students, the kids, and it has to work for everybody in this town. And that's where I think a lot of people are. There are a lot of people on making oppositions to, to things. We don't have to create oppositions. We listen, we talk, and have some respect. And um, also during meetings, you know, I think I, think I must be kind of um, a fiscally conservative person because I think I had the first nickel I made as a school teacher. <laughs> and <clears throat> time is money. When I'm sitting and listening to you, and I'm a note taker, and I also have a really good auditory memory, if I can hear it. I'm getting a little long of tooth. <laughs> but please don't ask redundant questions. I mean, if you don't understand it, yeah, I get that. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic. But, you know, like, when Phil was laying out um, what we had done with the building project, I mean, I must have heard that 20 times. And you have amazing patience with people, I mean, with the public, and going over the same things. So, <clears throat> I expect, when I come to listen, as a taxpayer, that people know what's on the agenda, they know the information, and this is not everybody. And of course, sometimes we all kind of go, oh, okay, yeah, I heard that, but I forgot it. But let's move forward with it. as little obstruction as possible, good faith and respect for each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To speak. <laughs> we have something to say. If not, we have a uh, session later on we can make comments. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, next business in order is uh, Chairman's uh, report. And uh, the Chair wishes to make a statement uh, regarding the uh, offices of the Building and Board of Education. Let the record show the Building <coughs> Board of Selectmen appointed to the Office of Lincoln Board of Education Board Chair on January 6, 2020. The Wellington Board of Selectmen <coughs> appointed Michelle Cunningham to the Office of Wellington Board of Education Board Secretary on January 6, 2020. The Wellington Board of Education nominated and elected Elena Tajak to the Office of Wellington Board of Education Board Vice Chair on January 23rd, 2020. <coughs> the offices of the Wellington Board of Education are, for the record, Herbert Errico, Board Chair, Elena Tessier, 
uh, board vice chair and Michelle Cunningham, board secretary. Well, I, I'd like to thank the Board of Selectmen for appointing um, the uh, board chairman. That's me. I'll, I'll try to do my best uh, to carry on the office of, of uh, chair and uh, deal with the meetings credibly, uh, fairly, uh, expeditiously, uh, and to protect the rights of all of the members of the uh, board. And that will be my declaration. The next uh, item in the order of business is the review of programs previously presented and Board of Education discussion. So last meeting we reviewed program one, which is center school, program two, which is fall school, and program four, which is transportation. Uh, just a quick recap, the increases for Program 1 are, are basically directly linked to contractual increases. Uh, the decrease for Program 2 is due to that new grant offset that we had to apply to Hall instead of Center, um, as well as adjusting salaries from HMS to CES and, and we, uh, hiring folks that were uh, lower staff. And then Program 4 has a contract, contractual increase as well. We're continuing to investigate the shared services with Region 19 and M&J Fossing that I talked about last time. Uh, now that you've actually had a chance to go through your, your binders and the, the, the programs, do you have any questions about those three specific <coughs> programs or any discussion? I do. My question concerns transportation. Okay. Uh, during the last meeting, you mentioned <coughs> by changing the bus routes, we, uh, it was not our goal, but we ended up saving, by combining children on the stops, we ended up saving over around $1,000 of gallons a month. Is that saving somewhere in the budget or not? Did you count that savings? I did not because I don't know that we have enough data to do so. The difference for each month that we saw, one month was 121 gallons, one was 276, and one was 690. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to have to collect more data to see okay. if it's consistent. If you see that, hey, the average is 250, then I think that's the point where you can make the reduction. Uh -huh. um, but I think you're going to have to wait on more data to, to see what it looks like. Uh, okay, actually my, uh, my concern was from the opposite side. but. Um, I personally have problem with children being picked up as groups. I don't think our town street are uh, accommodated for the safe grouping of the children. That's my serious concern for this question. So I think maybe we can put it on for the discussion for our next regular meeting. Not the special, but the regular meeting. Yeah, one of the can things, we talk about it? Yeah, one of the things actually I was going to add, um, and I haven't even talked to you, Herb, about this, is that because we were going to talk committees next time, and because of what I shared last meeting, I think it would be wise to have a transportation committee. Not that's something that's going to be long term, but to talk about all the things that are really going on with transportation, that included. Mm -hmm. um, routes, to look at your what's in your policy, um, and to talk about moving forward if we're going to look at K-8 to busing uh, and not two separate runs. I think that's important for a committee to, to sh share details and, and go through present. So. But So can we put it like not on the special meeting but on the regular meetings? Yeah, because the, whatever the restrictions with the special meeting are... Uh, You're talking about the February. We haven't set the um, agenda yet for that February meeting, so, okay. so you could add it as long as Herb, you're fine with that. Well, uh, I also, I don't know if it's probably not a good moment for that. I'm just, it's my personal thinking. I think because we have so many meetings, if we're going to be all set with the budget on February 4th, maybe we can just skip that February 11th. What do you think? Do we need to have that special meeting? I mean, so that's your regular meeting. Your budget <coughs> meeting is February 4th. No, uh, I thought budget 4th. Oh, yes, it's a budget meeting on February 4th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our regular meeting, which is a special meeting, is on February 11th. 
plus the extra if we have if we need, we need it yes plus the extra before if we need it so I was thinking if we are all set like if we're going to finish up the budget next week on February 4th I'm just suggesting I'm not saying I have problem with that I can but just to give us a little break right? Do we have to wait until the end of the February fourth meeting to see? Yeah, I know, but I'm just throwing it. Everything? I'm just throwing like an idea for consideration for thinking about it. Elena, the eleventh is our regular scheduled meeting, so we must have that meeting. That's not regular. It's I've a special. Got two, I've got two meetings. On yeah, the mm -hmm. we cannot hold a regular meeting at eleven. That's why we made it a special, and if we. Yeah. But we have a budget meeting at 6 p.m. If we need the 7 it. p.m. Yes. special meeting would yes. be in place of our regular meeting because it was not able to be on yes. the calendar. Yes, that's why that's why I'm I'm just asking. I don't know if there is anything urgent for the special meeting. If nothing urgent or maybe little things, maybe we can consider it like February 4th and skip that week. No, we could what we could do if the special part of the meeting goes from six to seven. The budget meeting, if we need it. Yes. Um, if you're saying if we don't need it, we could just meet at seven mm -hmm. for a regularly monthly meeting. But do we, we have? Cannot skip we're that. supposed to. That's what, that was not a regular meeting. That was a special. Meeting. It is the regular meeting, but special about it is that we were going to come in at six o'clock. No, 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 no. Am no, I wrong? No. No. Am mm -hmm. I wrong? Yes. The the is budget. The second Tuesday. The this is the meeting that. You, it was under the 30 days when you approved your calendar, so you couldn't schedule a regular meeting because it was oh. under 30 days. So you could call a special meeting. That special meeting was the meeting that you were supposed to approve your budget at, and I think you've said that as part of this budget process that you've announced that that would be the night you would vote on the budget, not prior to this. The question would be... The fourth. We voted on, on the 4th. No. no, no. No, what has been said publicly was that we would vote on this on Tuesday, February 11th at the 7 o'clock meeting. When will we have our regular meeting? That is your regular meeting, but it has to be called a special meeting because it was under 30 days. But we can do our regular meeting before. That would be the plan. Okay. Right. Okay. I was just, I just thought we have so many meetings. That's, that's I said maybe we were a little bit. I mean, I have, I'll be honest with you. I haven't even looked at that agenda yet. I haven't talked to Herb about it yet to see what's what would be on the February agenda. Um, so I, I it, so. right. It could be a fast agenda if there's not a lot on there and it's just to prove the budget. Especially if you all know where you stand prior to that point through your discussion. And I look that next week we have really the easiest the easiest problems, the quickest problems. Maybe we can just make it longer. And be done there with everything. That's I'm just thinking. I that, but that's okay. So just we, if we put it if, in my my understanding is that because we said in our at our last regular meeting two weeks ago that we were going to vote on the budget on the 11th. It's in the minutes. So the public have seen that we can't oh, okay. change the if, time of our meeting. If that was our decision, I missed that. I apologize. Yes, that's okay. But again, it could course. be a fast meeting if you yes. have. I th I'm going to share what happened last year. Is it there? And we added this in the agenda and BOE discussion explicitly because everyone was tight lipped last year. There was not a lot of dialogue about, wow, I think we should cut that or add that until you sat at the table and it was time to vote. If you know those discussions ahead of time and you, you, know, you know where people stand, I think it's easier for you to have a quicker meeting on the 11th. Okay. But if you hold your thoughts until that date, okay. it becomes more of a, a longer discussion, I would say. So yeah. So we can bring the changes if we want to make any changes. We can vote for them and bringing them in during our these meetings today right. and next. And that's why I okay. added in this year. We didn't have this last year review of programs previously presented. Oh, okay. So if you had questions like you just did. Oh, okay. um, you know, to answer those questions or to say, hey, does that reflect, why, why do we have that program one, or I'm not sure about that, or, you know, Herb said last time, I'm not sure about the supplies, is that enough money? Those are conversations you want to have as a board, so it's also going to give me direction, because when I go back to Donna, we need to revamp the budget and, and make sure it's correct, and I don't like doing it on the fly with her in the front row, because we're going to, you're going to vote on a number, and it's got to be right. 
So we really, you know, it doesn't matter what I think, it's a contract and it's not going to change. Versus this stuff where our input makes a difference. And the art input on the contracts makes a difference when the contract is being signed. But the teacher's contract is done. You know, so whether anybody likes it or doesn't, that's the way it is. Um, and just kind of segregating the stuff that we have to live with from the stuff that we can change. Honestly, it's a huge number. It is. I, I mean, Herb, I think you said over 90% last yeah. time, and I think he's probably right. I don't have the breakdown that way. You, is that what you said? 97%? I think, yeah, so. I, I think you're probably pretty close. Yeah. I mean, if you look at program one, Don, and I'll just give you a sense of the reality of this. Anything in salaries that you see in program one, you have $1.6 million there, that's all contractual. Yeah. So, so we're talking about $30,000. And some of that may be contractual too. Right. You need your telephone, you need your internet, you need your you know trash, you need your copiers, yeah. you need to have a, a grading system. So if you're looking at purchase services and you wanted to consider some, you know, eliminating the program, we just adopted iReady as, as our testing program. That's the majority of that seven thousand dollars, right? Yeah. So, okay, I just the supplies. He asked last time if it was gray, and that's why I say coming in at three two five for me. You, in these programs that have already been presented, there is not a lot of items that are not that are not contractual. Okay. You're going to see some things tonight that you may not like that I added in there. That's okay. And I'll share it with you. And, and so that's where you may see something that, and I'll explain why it's there. Yeah. And then you can have dialogue. Around. Does that make sense? That it's a Thank big you. percentage though. So any other questions about the programs one, two, or four that were reviewed? Yeah, I'm, uh, I mentioned uh, security previously. Yes. And there was no money in here really for uh, security. We've done a few things, I guess, over the last few years in relation to that, but uh, well, I, I think this is an important item, and there's nothing in here anywhere that I can see. I don't do it. You're going to find one, yeah. And whatever it is, it's not very much. It's not a lot. You're correct. It's not a lot. They're really... Um, I mean, I know, I know we're making you know, a school building, then you live around and so forth, but that's all... Hypothetically, so you can do it. Sure. What are we doing in the We have uh, some things that we should be doing, especially the entry rates <coughs> in both schools. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that we would either put it in the budget or we go to the Board of Finance. It would be in CAP, the CIP. It would be in CIP. Yeah. yeah. It would be in CIP. Yeah. It's that we need to expedite this to, yeah. to make sure that the youngsters are yeah. safe. I mean, it's enough to say we're doing, and I think we're doing probably uh, some security, and it's probably adequate up to the point, but to me it's a fairly serious item today. Mm -hmm. And to neglect it, yes, the new it phone system. Is, is pretty difficult because um, it's costly for one thing. Yeah. Maybe the, it is the budget item. Maybe it should be somewhere else. There are Maybe two we items. Just go to the board of finance. This is what we need. Yeah. Let's see if you can do There's two items that are in the budget in program nine that relate to that. Um, the majority of the other items come in CIP. Come through CIP. The phones you just mentioned yeah. are <laughs> one of those security items that came through CIP that added an extra layer. Someone calls nine one one or from any of the buildings, including this one, it hits certain phones, so we know. So, and it says where. You know, Donna Cook, the press, you know, dial 911 from her office. I get that on my phone. So there's different security features that have been put in as far as like vestibules or double buzzing, situations like that. It's not in CIP yet. But that's why I brought them up to say in the future, those are things 
um, you know, obviously depending on what happens in the, it is hypothetical. If there's anything with a building, you would not want to do those things. If there's nothing with a building, you're going to get a list from me next year that's going to have those things in. One of my concerns about hiding the security, and this may not be a place for it, um, I went to an event at one of the schools. It was in the evening, but it was recent. And I just walked right in. And not only did I just walk right in, but I walked right in and I walked by a whole bunch of classrooms. No one even looked, it was around, so, yeah. you know, just in the, t in the timing. Yeah. Um, and that to me is a, a safety concern, you know, if someone knows something's going on, just walking in, even if they don't do anything there, what could they be leaving behind? You know, uh, I think that we need to be careful at all events. I'm not saying people should be frisked um, and, and that way, but just even if there has been somebody at the door so that... Remember that when we get to program nine. There's a dollar amount tied to that for bigger events. Yeah, I also just yeah. maybe you maybe you explained it on the previous meeting and I forgot maybe I missed it. It's when it comes to transportation, our budget increased well noticeably for sixty something thousand, seventy thousand from hundred and thirty two thousand to hundred and ninety nine. Where are you uh, a transportation program three? <coughs> Four. Purchased services. No, no, you're in program. That's we're gonna go through that tonight. Huh? Ah, okay. Tonight. I said, okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that specific block. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Good question. I have notes about that. <laughs> Any other questions about those three programs? One, two, or four? Okay. All right. So I just uh. Remind you, if you turn to page 25 in your books, there was that special education instructional summary. Um, our pupil services special education director, Marsha McKinley, is in the front row. So I don't know if you had the opportunity to meet her. This is Marsha. Um, and I asked Marsha to come in. Special ed is a different world if, you, if you've never experienced this. Um, so I asked her to just give a recap of how does special education work and how do you know we equate dollars to students programs because that's what this is all about and so I asked her just to do a recap and it's based upon what you have in your your guides and then she's also going to stay so when we walk through the program um, you know to give you a sense of okay this is where it's coming from the other thing I'm going to remind you of is on page 27 you have your grants and there's grant offsets that are special education related. You'll see those um, when we get to, to program three as well. Okay? That is perfect timing. It's not perfect timing, but it's, we're just getting ready to start program three. Hi, Michelle. So, Marsha, if you want to just uh, start with a recap, talk about that special education process. And, uh, sure. Well, thanks for having me. You're talking about my favorite subject, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so I did prepare some information which hopefully will help you better understand what the special ed program looks like here in Wellington. Um, but I wanted to spend a little time talking about how do we get there with students? How do we get to that point where we're providing special ed services? So we do spend a lot of time providing systematic intervention prior to the point where we come to referral. Students are provided this intervention service with data collection um, where we come together as a team to look at that to determine if the student's making progress or not. If we see the student's making progress, great, they're on track, this is where we want them to be. If we see that they're not making progress with this intervention through regular education, then we decide whether we're going to make a referral to the planning and placement team under special education. If that's the case, then the team will come together and we'll determine if further assessment is warranted at that time. Parent <coughs> is a big part of this process. Um, we, they are invited into the meeting. We want their feedback. We want to hear how the kiddos doing at home. Do they feel successful at school? You know, are they liking school? Are they not liking school? That's a huge important piece. Um, at that point, we determine if we want to do further assessment to help us collect data to determine if the student has a disability. So we had we spend time to have about 45 days to go through that process um, with parent permission. And it's a comprehensive evaluation where we have our special ed teachers doing um, 
academic assessments. We have Alan Rose, our school psychologist, doing cognitive assessment. Um, we also potentially maybe want to do some um, social emotional behavior rating scales to give us some data. We also may want to have our OT, our occupational therapist, or our physical therapist do some assessment data. And then we come back together as a team and look at all of this information, which gives us a really clear understanding of the student's strengths and the area that the student has weakness in. And then we use the um, IDA, the Individual uh, with Disabilities Education Act, to help us to determine if a student qualifies for the services. There are 13 different categories a student can qualify um, under special education, some of them being um, attention deficit disorder, autism, learning disability, intellectual disability, hearing impairment, there's a few more. Um, those are some of the major categories. So we use those guidelines to help us to determine if a student qualifies. If the student qualifies, we get consent from a parent to provide services, and then as a team we develop what's called an individual education plan, IEP, um, which has specific goals and objectives that the student will be working on with the special ed teacher or the related services staff, whether it's the occupational therapist, um, the physical therapist, speech and language um, pathologist, who I didn't mention earlier. And then they spend time with those specialists to work on those specific goals. And we will monitor their progress on a regular basis, but then we'll come back to a meeting on a yearly basis to really look at that progress, see how they're doing on those goals and objectives. We're really hoping that we're seeing progress. Um, we want to try to bridge that gap for the student that has a disability, that needs that extra assistance, that our regular ed students don't need. Um, so we're looking to see if we're bridging that gap. Um, and then we look at the goals and objectives and we decide um, what changes we want to make for the upcoming year. Every three years, students are reevaluated for special education services. They go through another round of comprehensive assessments to determine um, what growth they've made, and we determine if that special education services is um, still warranted, or if they don't need that any longer, they can go back to the regular curriculum. Um, and we hope that's the goal for all of our students, but if they continue to need those services, then under that IDA, that federal law, they have the right to have those services, and we will continue doing that. Um, the one piece that, that I wish you all can see is the smiles on the students' faces and especially the parents' faces when we come back to that annual meeting and we're hearing about the students' progress. That student that a year ago couldn't read and is now so excited to be bringing home chapter books and reading chapter books, um, you know, or being able to count these, those math facts that they couldn't do earlier. So that's the piece that unfortunately you, know, you, you don't see that is just so amazing to be able to bridge those gaps that without these services, these students wouldn't be able to bridge these gaps. And we're seeing these students do amazing things, um, which is so exciting. So it's kind of a, a quick overview of a very complicated um, process <laughs> that we go through. But again, it is a federally mandated process through the IDEA Individuals with, Edu um, Individuals with Disability Education Act that we follow. Um, and I have to say, our special ed staff is just amazing at both center and hall. I've had the opportunity to be here for just a little over a year now. And it amazes me the dedication and the work that they put in day to day and the connections that they have with the students, which I think is key. Um, for some students who've dealt with a disability for many years, um, and school is hard for them, um, these connections mean the world to them. And these kids really enjoy coming to school, and we're seeing growth. Uh, we have about 80 students approximately, you see in the report that I sent you. Um, we have about 80 students approximately. That's pretty much our trend. Um, I've been watching that. I looked in past years. Um, we seem to be trending uh, that way. Um, so that's really my overview. Under the uh, Individual Disabilities Act, we have 80 students. Uh, last year we had 72. Uh, it seems to be creeping up every year. Uh, how do you account for that? Well, just, you know, it, is that, does that include 504? That number doesn't include 504. It doesn't include 504. Correct. So yeah. how many are in that? Um, we have approximately 20 students district-wide. That's approximate. I'd have to go back and double check my numbers. Um, mm -hmm. That those are students who have a disability. Typically that would be more of a medical disability um, that are coming to district with that diagnosis. 
um, that we provide accommodations for. Special ed, you're providing specialized instruction, so there's a little difference there. Um, that trend of the, the identified students, I've noticed kind of wax and wanes over the years. We're staying pretty steady between 70 and 80. Um, what we're finding, and we are not the only district finding this, we're finding more students who are coming in from the birth to three system who are being referred. Um, so we're really starting to see that trend rise. Um, so that I would say that would be where you're seeing some of those numbers going up. So, no, they're too classified as a five way four. That's it for following the school. Not necessarily. They don't. They won't come and go at between 504 and special ed. Um, for a student who receives 504 services, those are students who need accommodations like preferential seating or um, they might need help with organization. So those are accommodations that the classroom teacher can do. For students who receive special education, they need to have um, a change in the curriculum. They need to have specialized instruction in targeted areas. So that's the difference between the 504 and special ed. And in your summer, you still have a summer program? We do, yes. And the 504 is going there or special ed? That is for special ed students. That's for students who we've identified that um, are, are going to regress because of their long break. Um, so those are students, typically if we had a 504 student that we felt would need that specialized instruction, we would refer them to special ed for further assessment to determine if they would need more specialized instruction or summer school. On the PPT, do you, um, are you the only one that determines whether a student is special ed or 504? Or you, you have a committee? So. We do, yes. It is a committee. It is a process. Um, it is required by law to have an administrator, a special ed teacher, a related services staff, which would either be the school psychologist, speech and language pathologist, or OT or PT, regular ed teacher, and parent. So it is required to have all those team members present at a PPT. So the budget bottom line is on the flat. By that I mean it's almost the same as last year. Even though we have more students that are servicing. Mm -hmm. Now how many one other question and I'll open it up to more people. How many students are we outplacing? At one time we try to place them inside, internally if we could. Mm -hmm. But we must have last year we had three in we? Um, last year, well, they've kind of come and gone. We have a few that have come back. We've got a few that have gone out. Um, so we, the primary uh, for these students is we do the best we can to support them in district. This is their hometown. We want them here. But when we determine that they need more of a structured, individualized program that we cannot provide in district, then we make that decision to look for placements that are going to best suit the students' needs. So currently, in this budget that we're proposing, we have three students who are outplaced. Um, we did just have a student come back, which we're very excited about. But this coming year, we have three students that were projecting three. to be outplaced. Oh, I it was five. No. No. Last budget was a two, and we currently, well, as a month ago, we had four. So it comes and goes. Right. Yes. If someone moves in tomorrow and they're an outplacement, you're paying, you're going to pay for it, and we'll do our own evaluations. And you know, Marcia sits on those PPTs usually as well. So, mm -hmm. well, that's great. We can service them in, internally. We do our best to do that. Yes, that's very important. You know, we yeah. want to keep our students in our in their home district. That's important. Mm -hmm. But when we know that the student needs more than we can offer, it really is for the student's best interest. Then we look at placements, and we look at that as a temporary. You know, we don't want to keep them there for a long period of time. We want them to be able to come back into the district. Okay. Any other board have a question? Of course, my mind goes to the after school program, and you've done the presentations for us before about <laughs> health. Um, I see that the amount is flat over the three years. Mm -hmm. um, does that not include any increased cost of living for the staff? Um, that when well, we look at that flat line and we look at how we can best meet the needs of the students, so there are times that we don't need, we need more staff, we need less staff. So we're projecting that um, we will be able to service the students with that 
that number. So it's not necessarily the same staff from year to year. Right, uh, right. Okay. Sometimes we that do have sense. care support, sometimes we don't. So okay. we've been able to best meet the needs of all the students with that amount. Okay. And the number of students changes as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll go through the numbers too. We have, I just wanted to, if there's any other process questions. Um, you said that the three to five year olds that they're referred for, from a pre, from a birth to three program? Yes. Who runs the birth to three program? Different agencies run that. Many of our referrals come from ESCON, but there are several different agencies throughout the state that service birth to three students. Do you have a choice if they're referred from a birth to three team? Do you have a choice? From who they're being referred from? Well, when they come in, if they're in birth to three, mm -hmm. and... Oh. Yeah, so we still evaluate students who are coming in from birth to three. Um, we still go through the PPT referral process. Um, and not all students qualify for special ed services, even though they've had birth to three. Um, so we still go through our full evaluation process. And talk about how that impacts your preschool program, please. Sure. So our preschool program is really um, servicing students who have been identified through special education. But we do have slots in the preschool program where we have um, peer models who come in who are not identified. Um, we have two sessions right now in preschool. Uh, they're four days a week. We have about 11 students in each session. And it's kind of, you know, a 50-50 mix. Some um, are regular ed, some are special ed students. Um, so we're able to service those students to get them that early intervention services before they go on to kindergarten. Um, so we have a new special ed teacher for the preschool who I have to say is just been amazing and is wonderful with the students. Um, and has a very good understanding of the diagnostic process and able to really do really good assessments to determine if students um, need that special ed programming for preschool. So I don't know if there's anything else in that. Background is good. Any other comments? <coughs> On the occurs. Can I can I go through before you get there? Because I, I want to go through all of these. And I'll answer that question. I do, I know exactly what your question is. I just wanted to have her give a background first. Sure. Is that okay? Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so so as you go down positions first, there's one administrator that is Marsha. Okay, Marsha sits in all the, the PPTs. If you look at teachers, how it went from 9.12, 9.27, 9.35, this is a little weird because this program has 10 teachers. All of that is the percentage that's applied from a grant. There are 10 total teachers, um, certified teachers that are in this program. So it just shows up because of offset, offsets of grants. And that's where you see the preschool teacher, 0 0.06. It's just because the amount of the grant that is the percentage that you apply. If someone comes, in, the person that we hired is making more money, they're a, a lower percentage. So it's, it's just because of the amount of the grant. So the ten, if you add those all up, it's, it's 10 teachers. Does that make sense? So the 0.59, the 0 0.06, and the 9.35 is your total number of teachers. The offset in the grants is what you're going to see through the preschool teacher and the IDEA Part B. The OT and PT was a correction that we made um, at one of the last few last meetings where they were seen as a purchase service down, down below and uh, it was clear that they were our, our employees so we just moved them up top. It's 0.65 so we just adjusted where they were. The 1.25 secretaries is flat. One of them is actually Marsha's assistant um, who does all of the PPT referrals at Hall School. And then there's a person at Center School that 0.25 of her position. Probably I would say more than that, but we say it's 0.25. Um, the scheduling PPTs in its special education work. The number of paraprofessionals. Um, you see that it's gone up from 18, 22 to to 25 requested in 2021. That is exactly the reason what she was just talking about is it's through the PPT process, a student has been identified that they have needs, that they need paraprofessional support. It's not always a one-to-one, -one. it's just that they need support. That is the number of paraprofessionals um, that 
we expect as of today will be needed next year. So that's the result of our PPT. Correct. So a lot of PPTs. So it goes up, it goes down. Um, sometimes if someone moves out and they have a one-to-one, -one, that one-to-one -one is no longer needed. So that number kind of, there's a, it's an ebb and flow to that. Now I have some good news connected to that because you're going to see dollar signs that we're actually going to be spending less on paraprofessionals next year even though we have three more. The, um, the grant, the contract, we actually have one of our grants, IDEA, we have a, a paraprofessional that's entirely paid for by that grant, and that's the whites of 1.0 separated, okay? Salaries, you see the administrator salaries, the change in the certified that looks like it went up a ton, it's actually, that's a shortage area, and so through the adjustments of people we've hired, whether it's preschool, um, last year when we knew we were gonna have someone leaving and we, we planned for a, a master step one, we actually hired someone with us that was on top step. So they're making $30,000 more than we expected. But you hired the best candidate, and it's someone who's working at the state level. And so that's the, the hard thing about special education is it's shortage area. If I put out a job today for a second grade teacher, I might get 150 applications in two weeks. If I put a, uh, an application out for a special education teacher, I might, might get five applications in two weeks <laughs> if I'm lucky. Um, the OTPT is, the number is, oops, there's an extra three on there, is that uh, yours too? Yes, it is. Not mine. Nope, not mine. Hopefully it's not yours. OTPT, um, that's been added into salaries instead of purchase services. So when you see the difference, um, and oh, sorry, by the way, I gave you a new handout of what, with a whole bunch is <laughs> in it, because we noticed in 1819 and 1920 numbers, they did not match. The 2021 column was entirely correct. Uh, the two items that were corrected, if you look at secretarial, it now says on your updated one, it says $74,416. It used to say $72,964. It's just because we copied them over wrong. So the correct numbers uh, are on your new page that had the hole punches in it. Sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. My apologies. So those are, uh, Donna, those are contractual increases as they go across. Paraprofessionals. Now, here's the note that I was going to refer to a moment ago with the number of paraprofessionals. We had an approved for 1920, $219,775 for paraprofessionals. Those are our Willington employees. We had also, if you scroll down to um, under purchase services where it says profession, paraprofessionals, we also contracted out $598,048 worth of paraprofessionals for this year. That's what we planned on. Through a lot of conversations with Marsha and a lot of her hard work, we discovered that we believed we were going to see savings if we added more paraprofessionals into our union because the contracted weight rate was getting so high. And we were right. So if you add together those two numbers and then you add together what we're looking for in 2021, the 411,536, we added more people to our union, the Wilmington Union, and then you scroll down to the bottom, it's 362, 395. It's about $40,000 in savings and you're getting three more paraprofessionals than you had. That's the type of work I talked about last time that is ongoing. You're not going to see it in a budget cut. You're going to see it when we present the budget. And that's what we continually do. We constantly ask ourselves, is there a way we can be more efficient with our dollars? And that's a prime example of how we've done that. Is that clear of how we did that? I really didn't understand that. So if you look at 1920, Yes. See where it says under salaries, paraprofessionals, yes. 219,000? Mm -hmm. Same column, scroll down, scroll down mm -hmm. to 598,000? Yes. If you add those two together, mm -hmm. we were getting 22 paraprofessionals for that amount, which was about 810,000. 
Ah, oh, so those are diff. Ah, okay. So those are the same. They're different paraprofessionals. They're different paraprofessionals. Ah, okay. The ones that are in the salary column okay. are our union employees. Ah, okay. That I, I got it. The that. ones that are under purchase services are an East Con hire or a Crec hire, and so we have now taken some of those employees, and you see the 598 went to 362. Uh -huh. That that number. They were added to the top part, and that's why the 219 went to 411. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the totals were $810,978 this year for 22 paraprofessionals mm -hmm. versus $773,931 for 25. That's great. Thank you for explaining. Absolutely. So the paraprofessionals that are under purchase services? Yes. We're paying another entity, correct? And they're providing them. We're not using them, them as individual subcontractors. They're working for somebody else. Correct. So they're East Con or they're they're correct employees. Okay. And so the question of why? Why do we do that? Number one is, as your numbers move, if they're in your union, it, it makes it a lot harder because it becomes like a riff. So if if you're the last in the door and we eliminate a position, you're out the door, but you might be the best qualified to work with a student. It makes it a little more complex. We're also not paying benefits to those people that work for East Con and Craig. They are. Are the benefits in the salary? They're in the salary. So, and we always talk about this, about Craig is a little more expensive than East Con, um, but we're looking for quality. We're not just looking for it annual person. If we bring someone into um, the union, into the Wellington union, we're sure we want that person to stay with us. And to be honest with you, unfortunately, sometimes they don't want to come into the union because they're going to make significantly less. So, um, but the fact that, you know, I mean, we crunched the numbers on this for a while and said we think we're going to see savings. Um, because there's insurance that goes along with this too, and, and we were right. So just in the salary alone, we're looking at about forty thousand dollars in savings. So is that why you still have people in the um, these contract that you still in the purchase service area? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it's not because we don't want to add them in. It's because you just it, it comes and goes. The number of pairs you need changes with IEPs. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, you know, it's part of our agreement. The other thing is, you know our, sh our, our sub shortage. Current professionals is no different. That you can go, I was at Target this past weekend, there's a sign on the door, $13 an hour minimum. We're paying less than that. Even though eventually you'll have to get there because of minimum wage. But if someone can go elsewhere, they have the ability to do that. And it's one of those positions that is... Um, just not pay as well, and that's not just Wellington, it's, it's across the board. Um, so sometimes they want to be in East Conroe correct there because they'll get paid more there. So, and also, if we if, if that service was decreased, they're working for East Con, they could also be placed other places if we didn't need their service anymore. They're not losing their job, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So that's a big deal about the paraprofessionals. Um, the certified classified subs there for special ed, it, it went up, but it's, it's not significant. We base that data on, we look at, um, and we just actually looked at it in, in our December ad meeting, we look at our outage reports staff when there's, it's the entire staff including me, um, our number of days people have been out um, and get a sense of how many subs are we using per year and what's it costing us? And so that's where how that um, dollar amount is generated. If you look at purchase services, IEP Direct is our system that we use to put all of our individualized education plans into electronically. It's what prints out our reports. It, it, it's where all of our data goes. When a parent gets their IEP, that's what prints it out. Uh, I think. 99% of districts in the state use IEP Direct, yeah, right? Yeah, the state is actually, they can't force districts to use IEP Direct, but they want all of the data that we have to upload to the state uploaded by IEP Direct. The state is actually developing their own software, 
they're actually going to be changing the IEPs, but they're going to be developing their own software system, which will be, from what I understand, no cost to districts. So eventually we'll be able to take this out of our budget. But for right now, it really is pretty much a state requirement to have IEP direct. Yeah, and if you turn to the second page, this is one of the items that we put into purchase services <coughs> on the grant. And so there's a $6,000 grant offset. We apply grant money to this. Um, it's the last grant item on the second page where you see the 6000 Audiological repairs and maintenance. Do you want to talk about that, Marcia? Sure. That's for our students who um, have hearing impairments. Um, we do have um, the surround sound systems in all the classrooms. So that's um, this is referring to. So the teachers can use a microphone, which could amplify their voice, so the students can hear them. Some students, um, it can connect to their hearing aids also. So we do have maintenance and repairs that need to be done for that system. This system is one of those items that eventually, I don't know if this would be a CIP item or not, but this system is getting old. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it, it is. It's, it's one of those things that are, you know, we might have to make a decision on in the future to say, do we want to put a new system in and do them all at once? Because um, occasionally they come in and they'll work on a classroom uh, and it's, it's patchwork, we'll call yeah. it. Parts is patchwork. Yes. Is the system that updated? Some of them, yes, some of them, no. I'm trying to think. It was in place when Sarah was in kindergarten. You are correct. So, 19 years ago? Some of them have been, and if it's something that's in an IEP, it has to work. And so, we make sure those systems work. Others, you're, you're trying to get parts wherever you can. We move things around. Sometimes we'll have to order new pendant microphones. Um, but... It's, it's fun. If it's IEP related, though, we have to provide it. Do both schools have a disapproval? Um, center yeah. has it in all the classrooms. It's in all the classrooms. Yes, yep. Um, I don't, I'm not sure <coughs> it's in all the classrooms at all. The students who require the, the service have it. But I don't know if it's in all the classrooms or be. I don't think it's in all the classrooms. I don't know if it's in all classrooms. Yeah. No. It's only in classrooms at Hall that are required. And I don't know if it was yeah. grant related years ago when they put them in all the classrooms or what it was. But mm -hmm. the next line is tuition outplacement. So you see the movement here. If you look at year, you know that 1819, 285 to 1921, 53, and then it, it jumps to 379. That is. Um, we're planning for three outplacements in that position. The outside counseling is flat. I've already talked about the paraprofessionals. Can you talk about um, the, the importance of a, the behavior consultant at sure. BCBA? So we contract with ESCON for a BCBA, BCBA who is a behaviorist specialist who will come in and meet with the teams um, when it's identified through an IEP, when the team identifies that the student needs more kind of intensive behavioral support, um, the BCBAs will work with the team to come in and do what we call functional behavioral assessments. So what is the student presenting? What is the behavior that the student's presenting with? And what is the function of that behavior? Why, why are we seeing that behavior? And how can we change that behavior? So they are highly trained, amazing to sit and talk with them. Um, and they work with the special ed teachers, um, the counseling staff. We do try to bring in the regular teachers as much as possible to that program. Um, and they develop very systematic, clear um, programs, um, interventions that we have um, an actual action plan. They review them on a weekly basis to see how the student is progressing. They make changes when need to. Uh, it is invaluable. I will say that when you get to a point where um, a student needs this, you know, intensive support. If we don't have this in place for those students, um, we're really not meeting the federal law on that. So this is important. This is a position that you're going to see more and more in districts as time goes by. Um, most districts are really contracting more than one day a week. We have one day a week service. Right now that works for us. I anticipate in the future we're probably going to see that rise because that is going to be more and more of a requirement. Or districts. Is it the same person throughout the year that comes to one day? Yes, yep, yes it is. And I will say not 
you know how not all people are equal with the quality, uh, the people that we are working with, and it's we've had a few people come through ESCON, have been dynamite. Uh, just the recommendations, the their ability to co collaborate with staff, um, it, it, they get. It. it is an expertise that they have um, doctorate degrees. It is an expertise that, um, that is, it's just amazing to have and required. They only work with children with IEPs? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And they don't provide direct instruction to the student. They provide, it's more of an assessment, consultation, developing a plan for those students. So then um, it's sustainable because uh, they're here one day a week, they meet with the teams, but then those uh, teachers, staff members, paraprofessionals working with those students carry out those action plans throughout the student's day. Um, we have had the opportunity to have especially teachers and paraprofessionals <coughs> highly trained with our VCBAs. We have enough time in, 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 where we were able to allot um, time through the contract where we sent the staff um, with the VCBAs for a day to do some intensive training, which was invaluable for the students to see the progress um, with this service. This is one of the services that helps keep kids in district. Yeah. Um, and Marcia has said to me, you know, that number if I was going to add some time, that's where you'd add, add well, some numbers. You'd add some money to that, to that piece of the budget. It's, sometimes it's unknown because she's, the majority of her annual PPTs are in the spring. Um, but if you add hours here, obviously the cost goes up. But it's, this has been one of those items that's been invaluable for us. The Wealth After School Program, again, I think we, Michelle asked about it. It's really, you know, an after school program for students who are identified with special education needs. They're invited in. They don't have to come, but they can. Uh, we provide transportation for them. Um, sometimes it's help with homework. Sometimes it's review. It cannot, and I'm, I want to make sure of this, this cannot count towards their IEP hours. So in their IEP, it says you need to have so many hours in, of specialized instruction. This is a bonus. This is one of those success bonuses that we're trying to provide. Um, how many students involved right now? There's about 15, 15 to 20, and that it it waxes and wanes a little bit because um, we also want to make sure students are doing other extracurricular activities. So we have some, some students in the play. So when they're done with the play, they'll join well. So it's, it ebbs and flows a little bit. Um, the summer school program again, it's it's IEP specific. If there's a recommendation by the team for that they're concerned about uh, regression in the summertime, that they invite the students in. It's not mandatory. If the parent says no, we don't want to do summer school, you don't. And we staff it based upon the numbers. We don't just say, hey, we're going to have four teachers. If we need two teachers based upon the numbers, we bring two teachers. If we need five, we have to bring five. And it, you know. It may include paraprofessionals too, but that's um, it's a it's a ballpark. Yes, and we are mandated to provide summer school um, for stu for students who are requiring that under IDEA. Um, the evaluations line, the the tests that we have to you know the school psychologists things like that, is that also include uh, out of district placement uh, testing or is that not out of district um, neuropsych? Yeah. Okay, so can you talk about what the neuropsych is? Sure. That's really one of the other items in there. Right. Sure. Um, neuropsych is done when we feel that we need more assessment data that we cannot collect in district through our school psychologists, our special ed teachers, and our other related services staff. Um, this is done by um, neuropsychologists who provide a more comprehensive, in-depth evaluation. We're looking usually for um, disabilities that would be more than we kind of diagnose here in district, um, you know, with autism, other um, more intensive diagnosis that, you know, we need further assessment on. We um, have a very good relationship with Connecticut Neurological um, Association in Glastonbury. Um, this is, I learned about them when I came into district and had an opportunity to work with them. They are amazing. Um, they work very well with our staff. We are very guided and directed when we look for these evaluations. Um, we make sure that the evaluators have a full understanding of what we're looking for as a team. 
Um, so we provide them with diagnostic questions to help guide them. So we make sure that we're getting back assessment data that's going to um, really help us to make a final determination on what are the students' needs and how can we best support them. And there's also often a diagnosis that comes along with it with a big report of why. With so it's, it's comprehensive. Comprehensive with a lot of recommendations that we are invaluable to us because it helps us best program for the students. All right, Elaine, the transportation is directly linked to outplacement. Oh. So we're provided to transport students to wherever their outplacement is located. Uh, Marsha does a good job. She calls neighboring districts to try and share transportation because you can cut your transportation in half. Um, you know, if we have a couple kids going to the same spot and we can get them on the same bus, we do that. But this is a, a reflection of going from two outplacements to three. You have to pay the transportation, so that's the increase. The IEP nurse, that's zero. It's just a change in plan, um, and so it's it's zero. The supplies is a 1%, I think a little less than 1% increase uh, at the bottom of the page. It's minor. The conferences and travel are contractual. Dues and fees are contractual. Copier maintenance is really uh, a contract to, to keep the copier going. Um, telephone is basically a contract. I will say about the special education equipment for Center and Hall, uh, it's been zero two years in a row. Our, uh, we we're very lucky, and I think I mentioned this tonight, we talked about our occupational therapist and our physical therapist. Um, they share equipment across multiple districts, and it's kind of agreement that all these districts have that if someone needs something and they can move it to that child that needs it and it's in shape, they do that. Uh, I went to our OT's house one night and picked something up in my truck to bring it to center school so that a student could have it. And that's why those are zero. If we couldn't get a piece of equipment that someone needed though, we gotta pay for it. Okay. The rest of it is all of the grants. And so you see the excess cost grant offset, 100,000. IDEA, uh, Medicaid is zero now. The IDEA certified is salary, um, preschool, the classified staff is the para, and the purchase services IEP direct. And that's what it brings down. The, the, it increases their total from 2,079,000 to 2.3 million. I would say it's directly linked to outplacement um, from two to three. Uh, it's an you know it's two hundred twenty three thousand dollars more for between uh, transportation I think and the outplacement it's it's that's where the number why the number went up. Anyone else? Any anyone have a question? Comments? address is any is the medical field that may fall a little bit more under you know medical concerns or, but what I can say is that you know we have a free and reduced lunch program if we have a student that we feel could qualify for that they would certainly be referred we are providing snacks through our preschool program um, that is budgeted for and we are providing that to make sure that they are getting the, the nutrition that they need um, if there was concern then we have our school nurse that we would collaborate with who can collaborate with the family. Um, we can, you know, offer suggestions to families about, you know, talking with their pediatrician about certain things, but really that's kind of, you know, a family choice. But there are certain things that we have in place to support those students. Um, and we would, our staff is amazing at, you know, working with families and students. So if there was concern, they would certainly um, follow up with that. I want to thank you very much for coming in this interview. Thank you for having me. I think you talk for hours more. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's 
You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Marsha, feel free to go home. Okay. <laughs> that was the longest yeah. program of the night. And it's probably the most complex for folks that, if you have not lived that. So thanks for all the details. Um, can I move to program five? Yes. Okay, program five, health services. Uh, what you see in here, we have two nurses, one nurse per building. Um, you have their salaries there between the two of them. They have some conference money that's in there. We are required to have a medical advisor. That is the $1,600. Uh, when the nurses are out, that's, we have to pay sub-nurses. Sub-nurses are more expensive than a regular nurse. Um, it depends on if they are an RN or a LPN. Thank you, that's what that was. <laughs> so I took my tongue. Um, you have to actually pay them by what they are. Um, so the, the total for the purchase services is there. The, the medical supplies that you see is really minimal. Um, the, the items you're looking at there are band-aids and ice packs and, and gauze and gloves. It's, it's all those types of materials. It's actually um, pretty minimal. Uh, we pay their membership for these, their Association of School Nurses. Have a good night, Marker. Thank you. Um, and we also pay for uh, a, mere, a periodical for their, for their offices. Um, the one change that you see in the equipment Line that audiometer. Last year it said audiometer uh, calibration. This year it says audiometer because it's 20 years old and the company came in and said we tried to calibrate it and it's not working. Um, so the cost of the audiometer was not, is $900. That's what we're budgeting for. Uh, that is for one school. I asked if they could share it for a year because the other one has the same problem. Um, and, and the answer is yes. They can do it, and potentially they can. What they use the audiometer for is they're testing hearing, and it takes a long time, especially the elementary school. Um, it takes a long time to go through the kids to test them. Um, and so if she gives it to Hall, she doesn't have it. I mean, it literally takes months to get through all the classes. She has volunteers come in, and they go through stuff, but they need a working audiometer to do it. So the, the budget total there, uh, it's an increase of a couple thousand dollars, and it's basically the audiometer and contractual salaries. <coughs> if not, the next order of business in order is the um, program, program six. Curriculum and staff development. <coughs> okay. So Program 6, Curriculum and Staff Development, the uh, support for curriculum leadership is, is flat. I will tell you that that money this year is being used. We brought in uh, a professional from EastCon who came from the Readers and Writers Workshop uh, in, in Columbia University. And he's now working with EastCon and we were lucky enough to hire him. Uh, I think this is where I told you it's about $2,000 a day to have someone from um, the Columbia University come up and, and train your teachers on Reader's Workshop, we're paying uh, less than half of that per day. For And so he's working direct, directly with teachers. He's modeling the curricular programs that were in the instructional approach that we're doing. A lot of that money is going towards that. The team leader stipends, and we put actually on here, Donna, contractual, contractual for outside conferences, because those are uh, contractual amounts. Not all teachers use their conference money. Um, and, and actually, if they all did, that $10,000 would not be enough. Um, but it's worked four years, and so we have done that. The teacher workshops in-house is also connected to that um, professional development I was talking about before. Uh, sometimes we'll do subs. Sometimes we'll have someone come in on a professional workshop uh, and do a professional workshop. Uh, that is more professional development money that helps drive whatever instructional programs we would like to do. This also, for us, and I guarantee in the future, is going to have a social-emotional um, piece to it because we are seeing more students with social-emotional um, trauma, challenges than we have in the past, and some of this money will be used towards that professional development. You notice that it went down $4,000. It's a little weird because it didn't go down $4,000, and the reason why 
is if you look at 1920 and you add the $11,600 to the teacher workshops in the house to $12,845, and then you see the grant offset title two down the bottom, 14,445, 14, you get a balance of $10,000 because of the grant offset. If you do the same thing for 2021, 11,600 plus the 8,334, the grant went down to 9,934. When you subtract that grant, the balance is $10,000. So it's basically you're applying that same amount of money uh, that you did last year. Uh, the paraprofessional workshops is contractual. That's, you know, if a student has a disability that we want to send a paraprofessional to learn more about, we can send them out to something. Um, it could be de-escalation strategies, it could be a lot of different things. Um, and then the Professional Development Committee, that's a lot of the work we're doing right now with the Portrait of a Graduate. It's ongoing and it also, Professional Development Committee is, um, a portion of that is also going to be teacher evaluation. So this is where all of the training that you want your teachers doing and your administrators implementing, this is where the money is coming from, these, these support <coughs> funds. The expenditures that are, are there, um, it has gone down um, in total expenditures, but the budget total after grants, because you have a little less, has gone up just slightly. You see the team note in there. Team is the beginning educator program. Um, that used to be in this. It's been taken out because the state is back to subsidizing. They're, they're paying for it. And the Title I grant offset for 1819 that you see in there um, of 25000 the grant was written differently in 1920 and 2021, so that money it go, went into center school or hall school. Questions about this program? Utilities. I hate to say this, but you need water, you need power, okay. and you need heating oil. Um, so the water there is, is you know, we they have meter readings. That's the water bill. Um, the powers is flat because we have a contracted rate. Um, eventually, that may go away. The heating oil I mentioned to you last time. The price of heating oil went down. Um, Elena. This is where you see that savings in the budget. So 71000 to 66000 that is where you see it. You, you may not see it as much in transportation because we don't know the mileage of bus routes. But you'll see it here because we know what it's going to take about to heat the buildings. Okay. Energy performance contract these payments. If you've not experienced this one before, this is um, a little bit of a frustrating one. I asked this to be covered in capital improvement in the past and it was denied. So uh, about seven years ago, eight years ago, the district entered into an agreement with Siemens Energy uh, and their performance program. And what they did is they came in and they did a bunch of upgrades to both buildings, including spray foam insulation, um, lighting that was uh, a higher efficiency. They actually put these in, in, they used to all be three bulbs and now they're two. It's the same system in the, in the schools. It's a lower light requirement. The bulbs were free. We're out now past that, they're no longer free. Um, and so to do that whole deal, you paid over 17 years. That 36000 is next year's payment. And we're in year seven, 17. I think they're looking back at this going, maybe that wasn't such a good deal. Um, we track the energy usage. Uh, we have energy meetings. We look at the, you know, uh, I do. We do this for the senior center, for the town office building, and for the schools. And we look at, you know, you can see if the AC was left on in a month, and that's how we catch things. So we meet as a committee. We look at we look at usage. One year we had um, a lot more water used at hall. We asked the question why. Um, you know, is it is it toilets constantly running? What is it? Um, and so we 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 can identify those issues. So this is the total for this program. It's actually slightly down, um, and it's really because the, the heating oil price is down. 
And MCOR is in each building. Correct. Exactly. MCOR is, um, they're not in the utility section, they're in program one and program two. And that's mm -hmm. our preventative maintenance program. What are they doing for that $36,000? What you mentioned before. it's already gone it's it's basically you know, it's almost like a bond all the work is done up front and then you just your savings is supposed to cover this are we seeing thirty six thousand dollars in savings I don't know I don't know they, and they, did, they did do a lot of work they sealed door gaps they did you know a bunch of caulking around windows they did a ton of work I know at my house, things have been caught, and over a period of time, they're caught in the Are those things, whatever that it was... It's not on them anymore. Not necessarily on them, but is anybody looking at it? Sure, the maintenance okay. folks in both buildings do, yes. Okay. I mean, the spray foam was a big one. I mean, they, they did all of the building envelope gaps, the ceilings and things like that. They did a lot of work there. Um, some of them are silly, just like the, the door sweeps, so there's no gap underneath and they put sweeps on, on doors. I can bring you more details about that program, honestly, it's kind of a bit frustrating. <laughs> so, so we just send them a check, they don't do anything. It's basically, yeah, your savings is supposed to cover that. Um, it's hard for us to identify based upon our committee meetings if that savings is covering it. You've got a lot of work done for that amount of money. Um, that's all I can say. Okay. Light bulbs have come a long way with LEDs already. And if we have to replace a light bulb, we're not putting those back in. We're putting an LED light bulb in because they're going to last a lot longer. So is the town also paying a share of this? I, that's a good question. I don't know that off the top of my head. I can find Just that. with the lights here, I'm wondering. Because that's I that's think the worst that they're paying more. The so it was was. done jointly. The question is whether this is our portion or the whole package. Or if they're paying more. I think they're paying a portion to, as well. Yeah. Um, but I asked just to try and get rid of it because it, it hurts your budget. Um, it's $36,000. You don't have a choice of and it's something that's, that's worth it done. And I thought it should have been a capital improvement project. Just mm -hmm. pay it. Pay it. Yeah. Are we paying interest on it too? I don't know either. I'm sure that over 17 years you are. Okay, I'm not kidding. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Because then it might be worth, you know. I'll you find out. Okay, trying to make it go away. This is one of those I don't like to look at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Questions okay, about the Questions are all. Okay, the uh, next <laughs> order of business fringe benefits, substitutes. Review. Item 10. Program 10. Okay. Program 10. The substitute line, again, that 44,339 was calculated based upon the number of subs and the rates going up. So that's the that's where the number comes from. There is a new line there. I'm going to draw your attention to it. It was not a zero in 18, 19, 1920 because it did not exist. It is called long-term substitutes teacher. And this is the note in your uh, in, down below there. When a teacher needs to go out and they can access the their FMLA, their Family Medical Leave Act, and it is beyond a certain number of days, 40. The person we have to, that we bring in has to be a certified teacher, and anything over 40 days, you have to pay them per our policy. I think it's called per our policy. I think it's it's like you, you don't have a choice. It's bachelor step one. Instead of paying $100 a day, you're paying $250 a day. It's not a bad thing for consistency because you're putting a certified teacher in there, and the other, you know. But if that person is in there 100 days, a teacher takes maternity leave, and they have sick time left, you're paying two people. You're paying that person that's out on FMLA, and you're paying their sick leave because they have sick time. And you're paying the person that is actually in the classroom. 
You've never budgeted for this. And quite honestly, the number that for <coughs> in the subline is almost always spent overspent because of it, or they pull it out of health insurance savings if there is any. I will tell you, I did some research in this in the last three years. The average is 125 days per year. That is of paying double, paying the teacher and paying the long-term sub. You legally have to provide the FMLA. In a situation where the person runs out of sick time, but they still have FMLA time, you're not paying the, the teacher that's out anymore because they're out of sick time, they're just, it's unpaid, and you're only paying the sub. The 125 <coughs> is the number of days we've had where we've had an average paying 125 days each year over the last three years. So is this enough? 125 days at 250 would be more than this? It is not. It would be 31,000. I thought, I sat with Donna, and Donna and I went round and round about this one, and we, you know, we wanted to put something in that we thought was fair. And obviously the expectation here is if this money is not spent on long-term sub and there's no other crisis, this is money that you would decide if you would just want to send back. But if you have a long-term sub, at least you have something to draw from. And, you know, in the past, the, the, you know, your question should be, well, how they pay for 125 days in the past? And it's usually that end of the year looking at numbers and going, wow, we found some savings on this. This open PO was closed, we found some savings on that. Or they ran out of, uh, you know, we, we hired someone at a lower rate and when someone retired we could cover it. So this was basically creating a cushion for you to pay that person and know that we can pay that person. This year, with the special ed costs, this is a hard one. Because we had someone out on FMLA this year, and we're paying two people, and thankfully a portion, portion of it was done by our own staff. We just had to, their you know, kind of position was a little bit put on hold, and we moved people in to try and keep it going. But that's at a cost too. So if you go into the sick bank for that, then there is a cost? Sure, you're still doing the same thing because still I'm still, the sick day bank is in the contract. So if uh, Herb's in the teacher's union and Herb at the beginning of the year says, I'm going to donate one day into the sick day bank that year for the teachers. Herb gets really sick. He uses all of his sick days and he doesn't have any left. Because he put in a, a, a day into the bank, whoever put a day, a, a day in, they total up. Say there's 24 days in there. Herb applies to the union and the, really a, a, a rep from this board. There's a process, and they approve a certain number of days to help Herb out so he's actually going to get paid additional number of days. If Donna did the same thing, there's two people, they would usually split it. But I still have, if I do that, Herb's getting the 12 days and Donna's getting the 12 days, but I'm also still paying the song. So it helps the employee, which is not a bad thing. There's situations that come up and you have medical bills. It's usually something that's a crisis, right? I mean, that's why they're out. But in the end, You're still paying. there is no line in this it, that's been in the budget to cover this. Um, and so I added it in, and this is one of those areas where, you know, you roll the dice if you take it out, and you cross your fingers and you hope you don't have to stop a supply line or something like that to pay for something like this. That's why I went back three years to say, what's the number? You know, if someone goes out on maternity and they take the entire year, we can grant them the entire year. If they have 100 sick days, we're paying out 100 sick days for that one person, and we're paying the long-term sum. And that's contractual. There's nothing you can do about it. But that's not usually the case because people don't usually have so, Early in their career, don't usually have some 100 of them, days it saved depends. Some of them do. I mean, we've had people that have had 70, 80, 90 days. Uh, it just depends on their life situation. If they have the baby and they come back and that's, they're having baby number two, that could be the case. 
You just don't know. But we've had, I mean, the 125 is the, the average over the three years. So do you need to add the 10, 11,000 to fee to be covered? I, I, I'm going to leave that to you. I think that I, Don and I, had, I like I said, we, we had a long conversation about this, and we thought we put a safe number in that we, the number we have in for health insurance right now is 7%. If it comes in at five, the difference is covered. I don't know that it's going to come in at five, and so we're trying to be reasonable and responsible without putting the full amount, and that's why I want to be transparent about it. To say, look, if this is not going to cover the entire amount, but we feel pretty good that this is a, a, a good number to start at. We didn't think 10 was enough because 10 doesn't get you a good number of days. It gets you 40. And then if there's any money left in the salary budget, it could cover this. Absolutely. So if somebody retires and we hire lower, mm -hmm. um, that's where you know you make a budget adjustment. Well, this isn't just people going on maternity leave. It would be a perfect on the Sure. It could be somebody has to care about the leave. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. And that's, of all of the examples, mm -hmm. it's a lot of different examples. Sure. Yeah. And you have to meet the criteria to go out on that family leave. You have to meet that. That's I, I mean I think that's a pretty fair assumption unless you have something that you need that money for and you make the decision at that point. But I think people need to know that's not been budgeted for in the past. It's really something you should budget for. Okay. The substitute paraprofessionals, there's a slight increase there. Again, the rate increase the is really the um, the reason for that. I explain why medical insurance, the insurance is flat. Do I need to explain that again? Do you want that again or you got it? You good? Okay, same thing with dental, the life insurance, same thing. The unemployment compensation, this is another one that Donna and I uh, had a long conversation about. Um, in the past, you've put in $6,000 in the years that you don't use it, you could return that money. But we had a claim that came in, and basically the way this works, if someone files a claim for unemployment, um, you're paying about a quarter of their salary that, you, that they earned from you, up to a certain amount. So the range per week is between about $400 and $600. That's $6,000 doesn't cover that. We had someone that was on the lower end of the um, scale for the amount of money that they're making, and we would have owed twelve thousand dollars for unemployment. That's around the four hundred dollar range. Does that make sense? This is literally the document we get from the Department of Labor that says. This is your portion that you owe. Here's the salary for quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. And the breakdown says you owe $427 per week for X number of weeks. When would There's, someone you need know. to collect? When would someone need to collect? Um, if we let someone go. Oh, okay. If uh, someone resigns and doesn't get a job, I, I tried to fight one of these at one point in my career, and they said, you have no legs to stand on. There's nothing you can do about it. Yep. Absolutely. Someone resigns, and that was my question. They don't get another job. They can still file for unemployment. Yes. Your $6,000 window is not so safe, which is why we, and again, this might not be enough money, but through, uh, you know, Don and my conversation, we thought this was a, a safer number. And even though it sounds, the 11752 seems a little random, uh, we had some math that went along to it. <laughs> The workers' comp went up a little bit. 
Um, the Social Security Medicaid went up some. Part of that was adding some of the paraprofessionals to the group. Not all of that increased. And that's the savings I told you about with moving the pairs into that group. That savings is after this covering this. Okay. The tuition reimbursement is contractual. If someone wants to get classes beyond their master's, they get a portion paid. There's no more TRB that's in that administrative contract. That's why it's zero. We negotiated that out. The tax sheltered annuity for the classified staff, and that's within my contract, is an annual percentage increase, and that's calculated. Again, one of the reasons that went up is because of the paraprofessionals that are in that. Again, the savings is after that. So your subtotal there and your budget total, you see there. At this point, you know, we're, we're hoping to be under 7% for insurance. We will wait and see and continue to negotiate. So. But how many percent for the insurance you put in here? So this is where, because last year when we were negotiating, we were the number you had in was 14%. And that's what the 1. Uh, 1.163 million is. Mm -hmm. We left it flat because after the inc that increase of 2% plus what we're expecting this year should be enough to cover the any increase this year. That's why it was left flat. So, but we do not expect any decrease in this number. No, and the reason why is because remember that it also depends on who's taking insurance and who's not. So we, our number of people that have taken insurance has gone up. So if an employee leaves and they were taking a waiver contractually and someone comes in, the waiver's I think $1,800 off the top of my head, and then someone comes in and they take family insurance, which costs the board about $27,000, it doesn't cost the board twenty seven, dollars but the cost of the insurance is $27,000, you pay about 80%, the employee pays 20%, that's a huge difference. And so that number of people insurance <coughs> has increased some, and that's why we want to be safe and leave it flat. Good question. <coughs> Thank you. Any other comments? Suggestions? Discussion? If not, the next order of business is present to speak. Anyone in the audience would like to make a comment? Or Express an opinion, now is the time to do it. Yes. On the topic, give your name and address. Mike Acampo, 68 Latham Road. On the topic of special education, and I don't mean to sound sneaky or shady, but when a student, and I get my initials wrong all the time, so okay. please bear with me. EP, IEP, PPT. <coughs> is that strict? Sorry. I'm sorry? Before you start, you can make a comment or express an opinion, but if you're asking us for our discussion, we're not, we don't do that during our presence of speaking only. Okay. If you have a question, really, you can see the superintendent afterwards or give him a call, and I think you're going to be able to answer a specific question. Okay. But that's our policy. So. Okay. Okay. Any other business? Um, I guess there isn't any. So uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Mm -hmm.